we're going to continue with the REM school with a very remarkable manuscript uh, known as the Utrecht Psalter. Uh, it also dates from uh, the same time period, the Abbacy of uh, Ebo, and we determine that by style. It's known as the Utrecht Psalter uh, because it is in the uh, University Library at Utrecht. It is a book of psalms plus 16 canticles, two creeds. It has the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed, but not the Nicene Creed. And it also contains prayers such as the Lord's Prayer. So those um, additional sections are called the addenda. I should also tell you that it has 151 psalms. Uh, there is an apocryphal psalm in there. So when we give the number of the psalms, they're usually one off from the, what would be the, uh, the number in, say, a, a King James Version or a modern Bible today. The style, this very sketchy style that we associate with the Ebo master, tells us that one of the artists was the artist of the Ebo, of the Ebo Gospels and that this was created at the monastery uh, at Hovers in Rams. It's simply style that tells us there is no collagraph uh, that explains that. So this would be uh, the, the Rems Hover style. It is not a luxury manuscript. It's not purple, neither was the Ebo Gospels because they were not for uh, imperial use. Uh, they were for liturgical use. Um, this is created with a pen and brown ink, the same materials that would be used to create the letters. Uh, and the rubrics, the directions, the headings, are often in red. And you've probably heard the term red letter day. And that comes from the uh, medieval tradition of, uh, in manuscripts, of picking out, for example, the, the holy days. In this case, it's simply the, you know, the, uh, the introductory statements uh, in red. Uh, what you're seeing stylistically is, once again, that combination of a classical impressionism with the dynamic linearism. So you're seeing figures that seem to uh, be able to exist in space. Uh, they're very sketchy. They're very calligraphic. Uh, the line is energetic. It's expressive. This is known as a literal psalter. And that means that the illustrations correspond literally to the words of the Psalms. And sometimes they also correspond to commentaries on the Psalms. The suggestion is that this may be a mnemonic device, in other words, to help the monks memorize the words of the Psalms. This would have been a service book for the monastery. And every year, the entire Psalter is recited in the divine office. So it's a very important service book for monks. Um, the divine office are the uh, prayers, Bible readings, psalms that are recited. Uh, and the monks, essentially, they have what we call the canonical hours. Uh, and eight times during the day and night, they stop what they are doing or they get out of bed in the night office. And uh, they come to the church. And they say whatever is the um, liturgy for that day or that time. Uh, some of these canonical offices, uh, you, you have heard the words. You've heard the words vespers, for example. That would be the sunset service. And so we still use that term. And in every service, there is part of the Psalms. I'm going to show you how this works. I could do it in just one, but I think it's kind of interesting to see it over and over again in uh, some of the different uh, images. So we're starting at the beginning <laughs> with Psalm 1. And uh, the psalm, uh, first psalm begins, and of course I'm using translation here. Uh, this would be in Latin. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So let's take a look at some of these literal images. Uh, we have this little uh, classical, uh, I want to call it a classical gazebo, <laughs> uh, a little dome raised up on uh, arches and columns. 
And there is the blessed man, uh, the virtuous man, and he is uh, meditating on the Lord, uh, meditating on the word of the Lord both day and night. He's accompanied by an angel who seems to serve as both uh, what a divine inspiration and a kind of uh, spiritual muse, if you will. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And then you have an image of the scornful, the ungodly. Uh, and you can see that you have a kind of king on the throne with his uh, attendants who are just bristling with uh, spears. Uh, presumably they are warlike folk. Uh, and they're the ungodly. He's not sitting with the ungodly. He's uh, off separately. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law shall he meditate both day and night. And there he is with the Bible opening, and he's, he's reading and he's meditating both day and night uh, on the law of the Lord. And then there is a metaphor, and we'll see that the metaphors are shown. And he shall be like a tree which is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season, and his leaf shall not fall. And here we have this uh, tree with a lovely twisty trunk uh, at the uh, banks of a river that goes diagonally down through the whole page. Uh, and it has uh, fruit, and uh, uh, the leaf will not fall. Not so the wicked but like the dust which the wind blows from the face of the earth. And here you see the, um, the wicked, uh, all these armored men, are actually being blown into a pit, which probably represents hell. Therefore the wicked shall not rise again, and the way of the wicked shall perish. So they are falling into the pit, uh, they are all perishing. Now, here's a psalm that's uh, undoubtedly familiar to most people. Uh, it's called today the 23rd Psalm uh, in, say, the King James Version or other versions of the modern Bible. Uh, but it is Psalm 22 in the Utrecht Psalter. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, first we can look at the page. And we'd see that uh, the placement of this would be at the top of the beginning of the psalm. So the 21st psalm uh, has ended uh, about one third of the way down. And right in the center of the page is the illustration for the 22nd psalm. And you can see that it says in red, uh, 22nd, uh, XXII, Roman numerals for 22. And then Psalmus David, a Psalm of David. Remember, David was believed to be the author of the Psalms. And you can see that it is in uh, written. It's written in columns. Uh, that the initial letters are picked out in red. And uh, it's just a very, very clear manuscript. So now let's look at the illustration. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of sheep here. <laughs> Uh, shepherd I shall not want he leads me beside the still waters uh, we have the sheep beside the still waters uh, we have, well, look at some of these things we have a temple, the temple of the Lord the house of the Lord uh, we have a table I wish you know where that comes from uh, the, the person who is reciting the psalm is, is, is uh, has a rod and staff uh, in his hand and uh, is being anointed by an angel and then of course the wicked are below and they're shooting arrows at him so let's let's look at this uh, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and then later on it says I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever those are the closing lines so we see uh, the house of the Lord the temple of God we see the images of sheep and we see the hand of God over the temple uh, reaching out toward uh, the the speaker who is uh, uh, seated there on the rocks with the angel behind him. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And we see the river uh, stretching across the foreground. He sets a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And so here we see the table uh, with the food on it, presumably. In the presence of my enemies. And there are the enemies shooting uh, arrows 
toward the virtuous uh, uh, person who is, is saying the psalm. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And here's this great long staff that's being placed in his hand by the angel. Uh, and uh, thou anointest my head with oil. The angel is pouring out oil from the horn. My cup runneth over, and uh, he is holding a, uh, a kind of chalice-like cup uh, in his hand. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See the house of the Lord. Uh, another psalm is the Psalm 43 or 44. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou hast done in their days, in the days of old. And up at the top corner, you see these figures with scrolls, like, like they're reading the Father's words, and uh, they have codices. It's like they're, you know, they're checking out the, tra the tradition. Uh, and they all seem to be discussing things. So uh, our fathers have told us uh, what work thou didst in the times of old. And you can see on this, you have a walled uh, structure, well, like a walled city, uh, and the, there is an army of enemies attacking the wall. And in the very foreground, there are grazing and dead sheep. What is, what is this referred to? Well, it refers to some of the verses. Um, 11 and 22. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat, and thou hast scattered us among the heathen. Yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. So there is the metaphor of the sheep shown quite literally. <laughs> and then there's one of my favorite little illustrations to show that this is indeed a very literal psalter. Uh, we see an image at the top of Christ with his nimmed halo lying in a bed, taking a snooze. And on either side are angels, and they are imploring him, Awake! Why sleepest thou, our Lord? <laughs> so quite literally uh, referring to uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, God get, you know, getting up and getting active with this psalm. Uh, so the angels are imploring Christ to wake up. And uh, another verse says, For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. And so there you have the people of God prostrate on the ground in front of his temple, imploring God's help. Um, one of the fascinating things about the Utrecht Psalter, uh, besides the fascinating style, uh, questions of its origin, uh, there are some people who think that, uh, well, Celos was the, the name, um, who thought that this was a copy after a Byzantine literal Psalter. Um, Vormald, on the other hand, thought that this showed uh, Western classical uh, traditions. And um, it's what Stecco sometimes calls a creative compilation, is what I believe it is. Uh, that certainly it had more than one source. Uh, and it, it did have sources. Um, and they do seem to be in the classicizing tradition, uh, but once again transformed stylistically into something very, very new and original. One of the things that's very new and original uh, is new iconography. We see some things that become extremely important in uh, later Western art. Um, this is the first example that we know of of an illustration of the instruments of the passion. And you see on the left, you can see the cross that's raised up. Uh, hanging for it, from it is the whip with which Christ was flagellated. Uh, the crown of thorns is hanging from one of the cross pieces. Uh, we can see the spear that pierced Christ's uh, side. Uh, the, the lance with, his, uh, the, with the sponge on it. Uh, so these are all um, objects that are associated with the suffering and death of Christ. And they and others, such as the column of the flagellation later on, are called the instruments of the passion. And a whole devotion grows up um, centered around the instruments of the passion. People would meditate on them. They would weep 
uh, before them. Um, and as I said, this is the first time we see the instruments of the passion in art that has survived. Uh, we also, for the first time, and here I'm just showing you one example, there's several of these, uh, for the first time we see the suffering Christ in art. Um, and here uh, we have Christ hanging from the cross, bowed down. Uh, some of the images, Christ sways to one side. And this also has some very interesting iconography. You can see that there is a figure collecting the blood of Christ. Now, and it looks like somebody else is attacking him with a sword, or attacking him with a lance. Um, generally, we often see figures of uh, later on uh, that are ecclesia, uh, the personification of the church, who collect Christ's blood, or sometimes angels come down and collect Christ's blood. But this seems to be a male figure. Uh, is he supposed to represent Longinus, who uh, at the crucifixion he says, truly this was the son of God? Uh, we do see some biblical figures on the other side, Mary the mother and John, uh, who were present at the crucifixion. Uh, in the Carolingian era, in the Utrecht Psalter and elsewhere, Images representing Christ as suffering on the cross and his blood collected in a chalice begin to be seen. They may be related to Eucharistic debates during the ninth century. These were debates on the nature of Christ's presence in the host. Now, all parties believe that in some way, the bread and the wine became the body and blood of Christ. But what was the nature of that transformation? Rodbertus, a monk at the monastery at Corbeil, wrote a treatise arguing for the physical presence of Christ's body in the bread and the wine. He wrote this in 831, revised in 844. Now this is a little later than the Utrecht Psalter. Um, the bread and wine are transformed into you would see the historical body and blood of Christ, miraculously recreated at every mass. Rotromnus, however, another monk at the same monastery, held that Christ was spiritually present in his treatise of 845 to 850. And that under the cover of the corporeal bread and of the corporeal wine, Christ's spiritual body and spiritual blood do exist. Images of the instruments of the passion and of the suffering Christ on the cross emphasize the humanity of Christ, capable of agony, and, according to Rodbertus, actually recreated in the flesh during the consecration of the sacramental bread and wine. Now, these treatises were written after the Utrecht Psalter was created, but it's quite possible, it's quite probable uh, that they were being dis these ideas were being discussed. Uh, you don't usually write a treatise out of nothing. Um, so it is possible that these images relate to the new idea about Christ's suffering in his body and to new Eucharistic ideas. There are several theories about the sources of the Utrecht Psalter. Um, one is that it copies a lost Byzantine Psalter, and it's a very close copy. That is Selos's theory. Uh, it was promulgated in many books and articles. Uh, another idea is that it copies a lost early Christian Psalter, Dufresne's idea. And another is that it is a creative compilation, an original composition created by recombining and transforming different sources. Uh, this is Vormald's idea, this is Engelbrecht's idea, and I must also admit that this is uh, the idea that I agree with. Uh, I don't think that this is an exact copy of uh, a complete uh, Psalter. I think that certainly parts of it may have come from things, um, but I do believe that it has been transformed into a original Carolingian manuscript. Um, that's my opinion. You don't have to agree with it, but uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of evidence here. Now, I'm going to be doing some heavy-duty theology. Uh, this is the relationship of the illustra and illustration in the, in the Utrecht Psalter to the Philo-K controversy. 
I guess this is something that I could say, okay, graduate students, why don't you read this? <laughs> but uh, I'm not expecting everybody to understand and learn this. It's if you're particularly interested in the impact of belief systems and how they appear in art, uh, or you're interested in the question of uh, was there anything original in the Utrecht Psalter, which I do think there was a lot or original. Um, but I just wanted to show you this. Um, and this is one of the reasons why some scholars do not think the Utrecht Psalter directly follows a Byzantine Psalter. Uh, at least one illustration could not possibly have been in, an in a uh, Byzantine Psalter. And that is uh, the image of a church council which is at the top of the Athanasian Creed, the Fideus Catholica, which is the, the beginning words. Why some scholars do not think the Utrecht Psalter directly copies a Byzantine scholar. Although illustrated Byzantine Psalters are plentiful, there are no apparent models in them for the Utrecht Psalter illustrations. So once again, we're assuming something that does not exist. The multitude of examples that Sellos cites to prove that the Utrecht Psalter copies a Byzantine Psalter only prove the artist scribes use models derived from late antique manuscript sources. They do not prove that they were all copied from the same source or that the source was Byzantine. And no Byzantine Psalter would include the Athanasian Creed. But the Utrecht Psalter includes it with an illustration suggesting consular authority for this creed. So what are we looking at? Looking at uh, an image at the top of the page, uh, above the beginning, as you can see, it says Incipit Fidelis Catholicum. This is the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed includes anathema against those who deny the double procession of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we gotta explain that. Uh, anathema would be um, essentially curses. It said, if you don't believe this, you know, you're, not, you're going to go to hell, essentially, is, is uh, uh, what it's saying. And the double procession of the Holy Spirit um, is that the Holy Spirit comes from both God the Father and from God the Son. Now, this issue is called the Philoke controversy. In the Byzantine Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Nicene Creed, which is a different creed, but the Nicene Creed says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from God the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. In the Western Church, they sometimes added another word, Philoke. Um, which means, and the Son. In the Athanasian Creed, it's written slightly differently as two words, et filios, and the Son. And so they are saying that the Holy Spirit comes not only from God the Father, but also from God the Son. Now, you know, most of us today probably would say, oh golly, how would they even know? What a, what a tiny point of theology. However, this issue called the Philoke controversy was the main issue that split the Christian Church into the Eastern Orthodox and into the Western Catholic Churches in 1054. It's one of the causes of the Great Schism. Okay, a little historical background here. The Athanasian Creed was believed to have been written by the fourth century Saint Athanasius, who attended the Council of Nicaea in 325. However, today scholars do not believe it was written by Saint Athanasius, but it was widely believed uh, during the Middle Ages that it was. The earliest manuscripts of this creed are from the eighth century, although it probably originated several centuries earlier. It is strongly Trinitarian, in other words, uh, belief in the uh, God as three persons in one being, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it asserts that no one can be saved who does not believe its doctrines. The affirmation, and of course this is translation, but the affirmation, the Holy Spirit is not made, nor created, nor generated, but proceeds from the Father and the Son supports the idea of the double procession of the Holy Spirit. Spiritus sanctus a patre et filio. Non factus, ne creatus, 
Nagenitus, said Prosadus. The Holy Spirit is not made, nor created, nor generated, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. This creed was used in the divine office in the West, but never in the Eastern Church, in the Byzantine Church. Therefore, this image, which gives consular authority, you know, it shows a church council, uh, and it gives consular authority. Therefore, this image could not have been copied from a Byzantine Psalter in the context of this creed. There are Byzantine manuscripts that have uh, pictures of church councils, but not with a uh, church council approving uh, the philoke. The Eastern Orthodox Church rejected philoke by any terms. And although the Athanasian Creed used slightly different words uh, in the Nicene Creed, the philoke is Latin. Philoke is Latin for and the son. And this word was added to the Nicene Creed by the Third Council of Toledo in 586. Translates, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Western Church accepted this edition of Philoke, the double procession of the Holy Spirit. The Eastern Church adamantly rejected it. And as I said, this led to the great, to the great schism of 1054 between the Eastern and Western Churches. In 325, the Nicene Creed said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from God the Father. But later, the word philoke was added, and this created this doctrinal disparity between the Eastern and Western churches. No Byzantine Psalter would include the Athanasian Creed, but the Utrecht Psalter includes it with an illustration suggesting counselor authority of this creed. So, my question is, does this prove that the Utrecht Psalter does not copy a Byzantine Psalter? I suppose the argument uh, that, yeah, it could, would be, well, maybe they just added this one picture or something like that. But it does show that there is some creative compilation at least going on. It seems to me that if the church council is represented here, certainly it shows that at least this image cannot have been copied from a Byzantine Psalter and does suggest some doubt. Stylistically, it seems much more Western, early Christian, late antique. Um, and we also have some other manuscripts that follow, I'm not going to go into every bit of Carolingian scholarship, <laughs> but we do have some manuscripts that follow certain sections and they're full page manuscripts. Um, they cert follow certain sections of the Utrecht Psalter, which suggests that perhaps those pages had a common source, uh, that the Utrecht Psalter artist, the, well, I think uh, that one of the main hands here is the Ebo master. Uh, and there are other hands as well, that perhaps he trained them. Um, oh, and I should explain that. When I say by hands, we often say, when we're attributing something, we're saying that this is by this artist. We'll say it's by his hand. And so we start talking about the hands. Uh, so we're saying, when we're saying the hands, we're actually mean the whole person, not just the hands. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm giving you some evidence uh, that uh, this was indeed uh, a creative compilation uh, based on various sources, including, including some early Christian manuscripts or copies after early Christian manuscripts. Make of it what you will. I will not be testing you on the feel okay controversy, all right? <laughs>